So this Van Hoff factor comes about because a molecule may not remain as a molecule, it may fall apart. In other words, this is part of the reason why we kept telling you instead of calling everything a molecule, sometimes they were formula units. And it's like, okay, all right. One of the other things we talked about before was whether something could be an electrolyte in solution. If you have something that is an electrolyte, automatically that means there have been ions formed and you can know then that the Van Hoff factor is going to be higher than the number one because we are forming ions. The only way that can happen is if these things have come apart. The value of M should be greater than the molar concentration of the solute. And so we use I as a proxy to take care of that problem. Why do we keep them separate like this then? Well, it's much easier for us to figure out what M is than to know what the concentration of the particles are. Because we know the molar mass and everything, and we can figure out ex how many, what the, what's the molarity that I just created before it comes apart. So we need the I to help serve as a bridge between what is easy to measure and what is not. Okay, so these Van Hoff factors come from a ratio of the particles in the solution to the particles that would be there if the solute did not fall apart. And that's why we have these, where I equals one if it just plain didn't fall apart. No change at all. If it does fall apart, then it's going to get larger. And we said that we thought that sodium chloride should form two particles and that sodium sulfate should form three particles. But that isn't entirely true. This is the maximum I is two particles for every one formula unit and three particles for every one formula unit here. The fact of the matter is, as soon as you start forming ions, they are attracted to each other. So sometimes they won't completely separate and you will have what's called an ion pair. So it turns out that when we have Van Hoff factors involved, they are actually determined experimentally instead of you just saying, oh, I believe it's going to happen like this. This is a pretty good first guess, but it won't hold up if you actually go out and do the experiment. You'll get a number that isn't quite as large as two. If you do this experiment, you'll get a number that's not as big as three, but it will be bigger than two. Since the osmotic pressure is based on the molar concentration and this Van Hoff factor, it has to show up in our formula. Now, if you're doing this on an ACS exam, they tend to just stick with these whole numbers instead of going to the more complicated situation, which I'm going to show you right here, the more complicated situation. Here are some possible things that we are going to dissolve in the water. And here is the Van Hoff factor for each of them. In red is what we would normally think of. And as you can see, ethanol has a one because it doesn't break apart. So you put in one of these, you still have just one particle. Sodium chloride theoretically completely comes apart and we would have two particles. Experimentally, we find that it's 1.9. So about one-tenth of the time, the sodium and the chloride will be bound together still instead of having completely separated. Those are a plus one and a minus one ion. What happens if we decide to dissolve something that would form plus two and minus two ions? It's still, I would expect, that magnesium sulfate should fall apart into two particles. This is what I expect, but it's more than one. It doesn't just stay together, but it doesn't come all the way apart. Why? Because one of them has a plus two and the other has a minus two, and they're much more attracted to each other 
electrostatic attraction than something that's a plus one and a minus one. The plus two and the minus two attract each other a lot more. So this greater tendency to form ion pairs means that I is less than we expected. And you can come across here and you can see some other examples. Here's calcium chloride. We would expect that to form three, but here we have a plus two charge and a minus one charge. And so we end up with something, well, it's greater than two, but it's not as big as three. And similarly, here's one where it's the other way around. The positive charges are single positives and the negative ion is a negative two. But it's still, again, we expected a three, we only got a 2.3. When you get to something like sodium phosphate, well, it is more than three, but it is a lot less than four. This is what we thought might happen three sodiums and a phosphate ion. But what we end up with more often is two sodiums and a sodium phosphate ion. This happens more than that does. And that's why you get these extremely interesting numbers.